I'm so happy to be back and better yet, we're doing it with Luca Zorzi. So Luca is a Principal Geoscience uh, Specialist with WSP Canada with over 15 years of experience in structural geology and ge engineering geomorphology for the civil and mining industries. Luca specializes in the generation of 3D structural and geological models for geotechnical analysis and designs, as well as engineering geomorphology and geohazard assessment for civil and mining projects. And the 1985 Stava tailing stand failure personally impacted Luca, as seven of his direct relatives died that day. He represents the Stava 1985 Foundation, a foundation established to keep alive the historical memory of the failure and strengthen the cultural culture of prevention and correct territorial and environmental management. And I'm so honoured that he's joined us today to talk about the causes of this tragedy and what we still have to learn. And yes, thank you so much, Luca, for joining. I'm really grateful to have you. Thanks to you for, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, as I said, thank you so much um, for the opportunity that you're giving uh, the Stava Foundation and myself in presenting um, these tailing, uh, tailing stems fader that happened um, some years ago um, on, in, in the valley where I grew up. And I wanna personally also um, bring the, the, the thank you from, from the foundation and from, from the president, Graziano Lucchi, for the opportunity that you're giving, uh, they're giving us in presenting what happened uh, that day in, in Stava, which is we're proximal to the, to the anniversary next week. Um, before we start, a little bit of a disclaimer. Everything that I will be presenting to you today, especially when we will be, we will be talking about the, uh, the causes, the responsibilities, um, this is everything that has been officially published and is coming straight from the verdicts, from the final judgment of the criminal trial that landed in 1992, meaning that this has been material and documents and information that have been uh, evaluated, analyzed, and came to conclusion that have been used for the trial. So uh, when we will be talking uh, about causes and responsibilities, it would be like an objective presentation of what the founding findings were. And a summary of all this information can be found in relative books that, that can be, you can, you can find them on, on the website of, of the foundation. And even you can find them right now, you can find them online and as well. Moving on, I think a little bit of like a, 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 a a description on, on, on myself and how I'm involved and, um, and being involved in this, in this, in this event, uh, it's, it's necessary right now. So I'm Italian. I'm from Northern Italy, Northeast Italy, my, my hometown. I was born in Bolzano in 1984. I grew up between Bolzano and the Fiume Valley. The Fiume Valley is the place where my grandparents are from. And it's the, it was basically my, my vacation place. So every time school was, was done on Friday, we were going up on the weekend. Uh, same thing during during the Christmas break and in summertime. Um, as Jessica was was mentioning earlier, I'm a, I'm a principal geologist with WSP Consulting, deeply involved in the mining industry, and I'm also an honorary member of of the Stava Foundation. So as I said, I was spending most of the time. I was during you know until I moved to another town for university. I was living six months in Bolzano during school, and then the other six months I was spending in 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 Tesero. Tesero is a the beautiful little town in the mountains, and it's the it's it's defined as the gate, the, the, the opening gate to the Dolomites for the people who, are, who might be familiar with with uh, with the Alps. And for those of you that, that enjoy um, cross country skiing, that's the place where the 2026 uh, Olympic Games will be will be we will be done. So. It's a beautiful, very touristic place, and it's a tourist location since um, since after the First World War, to be fair. And the entire Tesor and Stava Valley were and are still full of hotels, and it's a very touristic place in which people enjoy spending, especially the winter and the summer and the summer vacations. But unfortunately, uh, this the valley is well known for something else. We now return to engineering disasters on Modern Marvels. At 12.22 p.m. on July 19, 1985, two mining dams burst in Stava, Italy. It was impossible to believe what we saw. 
how two banks of sand could become two atomic bombs that caused the total destruction of the Stava Valley. The rupture unleashed a mud and sludge wave more than a hundred feet wide. It flowed at a speed of 55 miles per hour. It burst out and uh, of course considering also the natural slope of this valley which is quite steep it gained progressive momentum it reached a very high acceleration in a matter of seconds the mudslide was over in four minutes but during that time 268 people died and four hotels and 50 homes were flattened i saw that everything was swallowed up there wasn't anything left not houses not anything the town of Stava was virtually wiped off the map. The event has been called one of the worst industrial catastrophes in the world. But it could have been prevented. Yes, it could have been prevented, as we will be seeing during this presentation. So let's, let's talk about a little bit the failure and what happened that day. So it was 12, 22, 55 seconds on July 19, 1985, um, 180 thousand cubic meter of mud and water spill out from the two tailing stems uh, plus in addition to that about 50 thousand cubic meter of material that resulted from soil erosion and destruction of building down the, the run out made up the total volumes of 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 this mud flow uh, the maximum height of the mud flow and we will we will be seeing talking discussing about that uh, in the coming slides reach 30 meter in some points in some location the area affected was relatively wide. The damage was substantial. 53 houses, three hotels, six, six industrial buildings, and eight bridges were completely destroyed. Nine buildings were seriously damaged. And the erosional process was quite widespread, about 27,000 cubic uh, square meters. The, the death toll was pretty significant. 268 people died that day. Uh, 59 were children, 89 men and 120 women, and as was said earlier, seven of them were my direct relatives. Uh, as was mentioned during the video, uh, the, the mud flow was pretty quick. Um, it covered the 4.2 kilometers from the start, so that's where the tailings were, down to the Avizio River, which is the bottom of the Stava Valley, um, in about four minutes and it reaches peak of velocities of about 9.9 .9 meters per second, which is at the beginning of the stars when it hit Stava, as we will see shortly, um, the velocity was about 90 to 100 kilometers per hour. Um, we know an awful lot now about the dynamic of mud flow and, and the failure, thanks to like this uh, seismograph that was recorded by a seismographer that was uh, placed uh, four kilometers to the east of the to the west of the town of Tesoro. Uh, a little fact: this seismographer, this uh, seismograph, was actually used by um, by the defendant during the trial as evidence of an earthquake that would have triggered the 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 the, the, the tailings failure. I'll say it right away: that wasn't an earthquake. That was actually the seismo the seismo the seismograph representing the event as it was unfolding. Um, and in fact, the, seismo, the seismograph uh, was picking the beginning of the failure, which has lasted about 11 seconds, which represents the failure of the, uh, the, the beginning of the failure of the upper basin. And then the material from the upper basin overflowed the second basin, and that lasted for another 19 seconds. So overall, the failure of the basin themselves was something around, the, uh, around 20, um, 30 seconds, more or less. Then the big peak is actually when, when the, the mud flow starts hitting the town and the, the village of Stava. And that happened about 20 seconds later. Uh, 20 seconds later, so in 15 seconds, there happened the failure, and then it, the, the mud flow reached the town of Stava. As I said, the Stava, was and still is a very touristy place. And the village of Stava was actually made up by three hotels at least, plus all the houses of the residents. And majority of the hotel were wiped out. And this image here that I'm showing you, that's, that's an hotel, that it's a damaged hotel. It was July, it was lunchtime, it was a beautiful day. And you know the area that was taken down by the, by, the, by the flowing mass was actually the restaurant section of the hotel. It was obviously packed with people because it was lunchtime. <clears throat> About um, 
about a minute and 50 seconds after the failure, the, the, the flowing mass reaches the outskirt of the northern portion of the town of Tesoro. And you start seeing the destruction. That's where a lot of the industrial buildings were located. And, and about uh, two minutes, more or less, after two and two minutes and 50 seconds after the failure, that's when the flowing mass reached one portion of the town of Tesoro, which is called uh, the Windmill Air Street, like Via Mulini. And here is an example of, of as a picture showing how the, that area looked before and how it looked after. And so here, and then at the end, the, all the flowing mass ended up hitting hard on, um, on, on the bridge in Tesoro and, and sort of like it loses power before reaching the Avisio River. As you can see, this one talking about, you know, Daniel, about to, uh, Roman, Roman structures, this is actually a Roman bridge. 2,000 years old or a Roman bridge that withstand the impact of the flow and mass indicated that, you know, Roman kind of knew how to build structures back in the days. Um, and um, so, as I said, it was July, it was summertime. At that time, I was one years old. Uh, but as I told you earlier, um, like uh, we were spending all the free time we were spending up in Tesoro. And that day, when everything was unfolding, I was here with my mom. I was here with my mom because it was lunchtime. It was 1985. Um, only like in some areas of the world, you started having cell phones. So what we were doing is we were only, it was only my mom and myself up in Tesoro. My dad was back in Boldano working. So we were going to my relative's house, my aunt's house, because they, they had a landline. And so the idea is every time at lunchtime, we were going there um, to, to sort of have a, have, a, have a phone call with Bolzano to check in, say that everything was fine. And so even that day, somehow we were late. That morning we were late and we were going here to my aunt's house. That day there were uh, seven members of my family there. There was my uncle Mario, um, my aunt Dolores, uh, they are two twin um, sons, Giuseppe and Giuliano, Sandra, who was Giuliano's wife, and Massimo, that was their son, was five months old, in addition to Maria, which was Mario's, Mario's cousin. So um, this is another picture of where my, my, my relatives were, um, the, the house of my relatives. And as you can see here, like right after the event, people were rushing for you know during the rescue operation especially in the media they were rushing to where the houses were originally to start and, and find for people so dig up and finding people but obviously they weren't finding pretty much anybody and as you can see everything was pretty flattened down so this picture was taken like the, the evening if i don't recall uh if i recall correctly the evening of that day and sorry, the next morning, my apologies, that was the next morning. So something that struck, especially the, the investigation of, during the trial was the amount of damage that was uh, induced by the, by the mud flow, which if we consider the amount of solid material within, within the flowing mass, it wasn't that huge, but the destruction was pretty, was pretty significant. One clue on this was it came from the combination of uh, the sediment, sediment has been transported, plus the, the, all the buildings that have, been, that have been destroyed, especially in the upper portion in Stava and in, in the northern portion, portion of Tesoro, plus the fluidity of the, math, of, of the mass. But in addition to that, so in, in the central section, especially the central section of, of, of the runout, the, the Stava Valley becomes very narrow. So becoming very narrow, what happens is that the flowing mass was preceded by 10, 15 seconds, if I don't recall, um, if I recall correctly, by a blast wave. The blast wave was blowing up the building, the water was finishing the job, cleaning up everything and closing up all the voids within the rubbles. This is the reason why out of the 281 people that were missing right after the event, only 13 people uh, managed to survive. And, uh, I don't recall the exact number of people that were actually pulled out from the rubble because some of the missing people were just not at the, ho not at the home at the time of the event and then they, 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 they have been found. 
and this is actually a picture that was taken by 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 a by a person in 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 Tezo that when they heard this rumbling noise just took the took the camera and took this picture and this this uh, this white cloud represents the smoke and the blast wave basically that was preceding was preceding the the, the flow in mass and that's in Tezero as well. That's where that's where the highest the, the highest height of the mass flow was. And so, just to put an example in, in perspective, apologies for going back to this picture here, but basically that's where the the flow in mass was about thirty meter in height. Witness my mom that as she as we were walking towards towards the towards the bridge because we were on our way there. That she heard the, the rumbling noise. She was going. She looked at the, at the, at the at the bridge and she she basically saw the house of like all the complex of houses even where the one that my relatives were living into she said they were basically blowing up and then the and then the mass was coming down to finish to finish the job as i said so because of this unfortunately the, the rescue operation um turned into like a, like a, uh like a, just a recovery operation pretty much since like the hours afterwards um, and they continued for for about for about three weeks. Um, and in fact, as I said to you, like uh, rescue and, and search and rescue people like run straight towards where the houses were before, but actually the majority of of the bodies were recovered at the bottom of the of the of the of the bridges and in a in a reservoir in an artificial reservoir, which is somewhere ten kilometers. Uh, to the southwest of Tesoro, because that's where the Avizio River goes. And in fact, um, the entire operation happened, like lasted three weeks. Uh, my my uncle was actually found about three weeks afterwards. Um, they they managed to identify him be, from uh, from the wedding ring because everything that it was left was his left left arm and left arm is in, and in, and his torso. Uh, my aunt was pretty much in the same condition. Uh, Giuseppe was found, it was the only one that was kind of intact because he was in the car, he was coming back home, and so the car kind of protected him, um, but didn't save him. Um, um, my other cousin was uh, identified because he was hugging Massimo, and Massimo was the only five-month-old kid amongst all the, all the victims. Uh, Sandra, Massimo's mom, it took three months to identify her. She was recovered almost right away. But they had to wait until the, the bodies were identified and see if any of the victim or the missing people uh, had had birth within five months from the event. After that, it was it it was determined that that body was was the body of Sandra. Uh, why am I saying this? Which is very graphic, and because uh, catastrophe like this. Uh, for family closure is when you can, when you know that you have like a, a place in which you can go and 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 cry on 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 a casket or on a cemetery, and finding a, a finding a body uh, allow you to to work on your closure and work on your grieving process. Uh, it was an example was witnesses outside the school in Tesoro in which they saw two family fighting for a femur. They wanted something to put into, you know put into a grave. But still, it was 1985, no in-depth in or, or detailed DNA tested were done or were possible at that time. So still, the remains of 71 bodies were still impossible to identify. So this is a, and, and as I was mentioning earlier, uh, a lot of the other bodies were found here in the Stramentitsa Lake, which is 10 kilometers um, southwest of the town of Tesoro, because when the mass hit the, the Avizio River, then, then the, the flooding uh, reached this, this, this lake. So this is basically a description on what happened uh, of the mechanics of the failure, the damage, and, and the impact to, to the valley. So now let's jump to the causes. And for, for the causes, we need, to, we need to go through a little bit of a history here, because what happened on July 19th is not a little bit of a spoiler alert is not um, it's not the effect of one single event, but it's been like the entire history of the, that operation, that mining operation that led to the failure on July 19, 1985. Um, when did mining started in uh, in the Prestavel area, so in the upper uh, Stava Valley? Well, it's pretty old. Uh, first record of mining activities is somewhere around 1528, 1524. 
Uh, what was extracted at the time was Argentiferous galena. Uh, in 1935, uh, then there was a switch and, and the activity were sort of focused primarily on, um, on the fluoride. And the extraction rate was about 30 tons per day. And until the 60s, the mining operations that we will see shortly were located in, in a valley that was close by called the Rio Gambis Valley. In 1960s, uh, the then company called Montecatini um, was expanding their production and adopted the flotation as a separation method for, uh, for processing the waste material to extract as much fluoride as possible. And so the production jumped from 30 tons per day to 150 to 200 tons per day. So they needed to build a, a facility, right? A tailings facility to contain, um, to contain the waste material coming off of the flotation process. And so that's where, and I'll say it right away, that's what, and here was the first mistake. They, the choice of the location to where to put and construct the tailings facilities, that was their first mistakes. So as I said, originally the mining activity was uh, localized through the Rio Gambis area, no need at that time because the, 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 the um, uh, processing of the ore was done in a different way. So there wasn't any requirement for, for a tailings facility. When they decided to move to a flotation processing method, then they not only um, they, they not only needed more space for the tailings, but they ended up moving the entire, um, um, the entire operation to the other side of this crest in here. And so they put it onto the upper portion of the, of the, of the Stava Valley. So they created a new office, new power plant, new, new, new crusher. And so they identified this area, which was basically a walkable distance to the, to the crusher and, and, the, and the flotation plant as the area where to put the tailings facility. As you can see in here, this is the mining operations and with the offices, crusher and flotation, uh, flotation infrastructure. And here is the beginning. So we're early 60s when they were starting building the, um, the lower dam. What was the problem with this area? Well. There was no, I say it right away, no uh, foundation characterization was ever done. No real mapping, no real subsurface investigation were done, no real understanding of the, of the condition of the foundation soils were performed. And I wanna bring you to the attention of one specific aspects in here. If we consider the geological aspect and especially the geomorphological aspect that we will see shortly, um, because of these you know, characteristics ended up uh, that the local people in the area there decided to give a specific name to that area. And they call it Pozzolo in, in, in the local dialect, which means marshy area. So the, that area is well known for everybody as, as the area full of springs, full of um, peat and full of very saturated soil. And why is that? Well, the reason is because um, this area is covered by a thick layer of, uh, flu of, of uh, glacial and fluvioglacial deposits that are made up of boulder cobble, uh, cobbles, gravels in, within a fine, um, a fine matrix. The thickness is about 60 to 70 meter, and which geotechnically per se, it's not a bad uh, foundation material for, for this type of structure, but what is the catch? The catch is the area is fully saturated. It's a ground that is fully saturated, and the water table, it's basically right there. It's, it's fluctuating between one to two meter um, at depth. But what was the other reason? So I'll jump back to, to, to one slide very quickly. So I will show it to you here. Here is the Rio Gambis. This is the Rio Stava. If we cut a cross section east to west in here, you can see that the Rio Gambis flows to the same deposits that the tailing stem and the Rio and that, that the tailing stem will be. Uh, built on, meaning that, and the Rio Stav, as you can see, is at the lower altitude with respect to the Rio Gambis. It indicates that basically the Rio Gambis is charged straight into, into the Rio Stava uh, through, through, through groundwater flow. Um, and this groundwater flow, because it's in the Alps, there is a spring freshet with rainfall, especially in, in, in springtime, and, and the snow melt, again, springtime and early summer in this area, especially in the upper in the mountains, a little bit late in here, the, 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 the freshet is around April. Uh, obviously the water table increases, higher groundwater flow increases, the great degree of saturations increases significantly. And if we look at these, at these graphs in here as a cross section, um, apologies, it's in Italian, but the, the, 
I will walk you through this, but basically in here, you can see with these arrows, they show you basically uh, the strings that have been found after uh, the event. And uh, this gray dash, this black dash line here indicates the profile of the failure. So there was no failure involving the foundation material. And this little star in here indicates a spring that was existing before the construction of the upper basin. We, we will talk about exactly dates right now in, in a second, but just to, to clarify, in the 60s, the lower basin was built, and in the 70s, the upper basin was built. But there have been springs existing already before the construction of, of, of the upper and lower tailings. Uh, this is an information that will come in handy coming uh, in, in, the coming, in the coming slides and during the, our, our history. And I'll say it right away in here, that no pre-ground treatment was done prior to the construction of the deposit. So whatever the ground condition were prior to the construction of the lower dam, the upper dam, that was it. It was just covered up by, uh, by, by the material, by the starter dam, by the embankments, and obviously by the tailings and, and the reservoir on the back. So in the 60s, we had the construction of the lower dam. Um, the, the lower dam began. Um, and it was constructed during the 60s, uh, and you reach a height of about 25 meters. As I said already, no foundation preparation was performed. And as I write, as I wrote, written in here, their pyramid was for a dam of nine meter high. They couldn't go past nine meter high. Then in the nine, then what happened is that the the the, the production increases, the the and uh, the there was the need of more. Or more space. So they decided to start and build the second dam. So they started building in the 70s, they started building in the upper dam. Um, same thing has happened for the lower dam. No foundation, no foundation was ever performed. I should have said it earlier, apologies for that. The lower dam was built using an upstream method. Uh, we will see like a, a sketch coming up. Uh, for the upper dam to maximize the space because we were going uphill, they decided to use a center line method as, as, as the start. And then they move progressively, and we will see later on an on a, um, um, a upstream method as well, uh, to sort of like reduce the downslope angle. Why? Because when they start re reaching the 10, 15 meters, they start to realize that mm, maybe something wasn't right. So they were trying to sort of lower the overall angles. And, uh, and then we, we arrive in here, uh, to, um, to, uh, to 1975. And I, in here, we need to, 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 to debunk a little bit of things. So the next couple of slides might be a little bit dense in terms of wording and discussion, but, and not a lot of pictures, but 1975 represents the year in which everything could have changed. So what happened in 1975? It started actually in 1974 when uh, the, um, uh, the owner of the mine, Monte Edison at that time, it was still Monte Catini, just merged with, with Edison, which was another company. Uh, this required, like, ask the, the city council of, Te of Tesoro, uh, put forward a request to buy additional land to expand the, the upper basin to keep up with the overall um, uh, tailings production. Um, but during the 70s, the local people were starting to ask questions about, about those, those plants up there. They were like, are we sure that everything is done properly? Are we sure that things are done by the book? Is, are people starting having concerns. So the mayor of Tesoro, strong because of this, these concerns by the, by, 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 by the people of, of Tesoro and for the Stava Valley, he wrote a letter to, to to the administrative office uh, that, that was managing the entire mines operation in Northeast Italy or specifically in the Trento province, which is the pro Department of Mines of the province of Trento, saying. And they were stating in, this, in, in, in the document that they sent is that the TSF appears to pose a serious concerns in terms of its stability and with the likelihood of it becoming a serious hazard to the local communities and the environment. So the district of Trento, because of, it received a letter from the mayor, uh, it had to trigger uh, some sort of like additional analysis and investigation to reply to the mayor of Tesoro. So they wrote to Montedison 
asking the mining company. That was the other, the other thing. They asked the mining company to perform an assessment of the current and future stability of the performances of the two basins. So it wasn't audited externally. They asked the mining company to do these checks. So the CEO received this letter and decides to put three people in charge of this, Morandini, Toscana, and Girardini. And uh, which is, Girardini is actually a geotechnical engineer for Solmine, which is part of, of Montedison. Uh, he was actually the one in charge for the stability assessment. And in the document that was you know, found by the police and used obviously during the trial, Bonetti asks Girardini, please work on this only during your spare time. They basically just need a piece of paper to calm down the mining district. So we are in June 75. In the same year, June's uh, Girardini did his work and wrote the first stability assessment report. And Girardini in his first stability assessment report is pretty, is pretty honest. He said that the slope angle of the bank of the upper, of the upper basin was exceptionally, was exceptional and that the stability is taken to the limit. Girardini says that the factor of safety of the upper and lower basins were ranging between 1.1 and 1.26. And so based on his observation, he was recommending in this report that additional geotechnical investigation on the embankment should have been done, especially to target the depth of the groundwater and understanding whether or not there was any sort of interdependency between the, the water level within the, the dam body and, and the groundwater. So he already kind of identified that there was some sort of like correlation and, 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 and connection between the dam itself, the two dams and the two basins with the overall groundwater uh, regime in the, in the area within the foundation material. So uh, Bonetti, the CEO of the mining company, uh, starts to ask around for quotes and he got a quote from Consonda Drilling Company to drill three geotechnical holes within the, the, the upper basin. Consonda provides the cost estimate in 17th of July, 75, but Bonetti closed that into a, into a drawer saying that was too expensive. We don't need those investigations. We don't know what really what happened between July and October, but in October, the final report from Girardini is issued so bear in mind that no additional in-depth investigation were done apart from uh, sur uh, surface walks and maps with, with, a, with a piece of cone and, and like a, a vent, some like very quick vent tests done on site. Uh, no additional and serious investigation were done from, from basically June to October, but nevertheless, 17th of October, Girardini writes the second and final report and he conclude that the condition to proceed with the upper dam raise where with appropriate caution appear to exist. So this is like a, a, a word by word translation from his report in Italian. There is no mention on what he, what he meant with this appropriate caution. There is no mention of what made him uh, change his mind from the exceptional limit and, and that, that the stability is taken to the limit to now conclude that the dam raise could happen. So with this new report, the mining district in his hand accepts the final report, send this to the mayor of Tesoro and the mayor of Tesoro cannot do anything but approve uh, the use of the additional land and expand and expand the, uh, the upper basin. There is something else in here to put everything into perspective in relation to the relationship between the, the mining companies and the local communities. We need also to keep in mind that before, during from the 40s and the 60s, uh, the valley was pretty much a valley and we're with, us, um, uh, with a very poor economy. Uh, people were just working away during the summertime, working especially like, you know, as woodworkers during summertime and in wintertime, they were living off of whatever they were able to earn during, during, during summertime. So a mine in the area was a huge deal for this valley because it was bringing a lot of jobs. It was moving the economy. It was also bringing somehow uh, tourists because when you have especially mine worker coming from abroad, they were bringing family, tourism was like boosted and all of that. And so all, during all this ordeal in the 70, <clears throat> 74 and 75, multiple times there have been, you know, uh, 
meetings pretty heated between the, the local authorities, aka the, the, the mayor and, and, and the municipal council of Tesoro and the mining company that, you know, I can paraphrase them into saying, if you give us a lot of issues again, we just close the mine and walk away. And that would have mean, you know, choking again the local communities during, you know, in, in, in a time in which having, having a, a stable job was, was very much, uh, very much something that everyone was very looking forward to. So that's more like the, the, the relationship part uh, between the local communities and the mining company. Going back now, jumping back now to more of the technical aspects, as I said, um, Girardini said that everything was fine. He tried to cover up a little bit by saying, well, you know, the good thing that we could do is sort of try and lower a little bit the height of the dams. How to do that? Well, he asks to have a, one of the idea was to basically start creating, as you can see here, this is an image from the 73, this is from 75. They started basically creating a berm and, and sorry, a bench, which you can see in here. So basically they created a bench to uh, overall try to reduce the overall slopes of the angle, uh, the overall slope of, um, especially the downstream slope of the, of the upper basin. I'm using these pictures right now, and I we will be seeing it in a second in the next slide, to, and to, to point you to the fact that because of space, as I said, the, upper dam, the lower dam was built with an upstream method. The, the upper dam started off as a center line method, and then they jumped to an upstream. But the center line, method, the center line portion of, the, of the, lower ba the upper basin, so the center line portion of the upper basin, had the downslope uh, part that was using the silt and the unsaturated and, and desaturated uh, sludge of the lower dam as foundation material. Okay, so they were using this one as foundation material, which is important coming in, in, in coming in the next slides. So that was also another issue in the choice of the construction method that they, they went for. Uh, for, for, for those of you that know more, more than me that, that, that design or, or, or work with tailings facility, they know that you know, it's a doable method, the upstream method, but you need to be careful on a lot of things. As you can see, you will have that as, as you are incrementing or increasing your dam, you're you are increasingly using the, the slushes or, or the tailings material as your foundation soil. So you need to make sure that you know, compaction rates and, and, and the dam height increase and increase rates, they're kind of similar to avoid that you have um, um, oversaturated material used as foundation material. So it's, it's usable, it's doable, but it's very tricky to use. And in those conditions, instead of considering the foundation soil, that was the worst that they, that they could do. And in fact, the lower dam had some sort of like, a lot of limitations in, in, in managing the stability because of the upstream construction method. They had very poor to none control of the phreatic soft surface within the dam. Uh, because of this, it was very narrow. So they ran out of space right away. And that, that why it triggered the construction of the upper dam. And because the entire system is very saturated, it's very susceptible to uh, static or seismic liquefaction as well. And the upper dam, it was kind of the same. And as I showed you before, they had the, the downstream toe of the upper basin extended over the unconsolidated and saturated slurries of the lower basins. We will see right now that they had two decant pipes that were constructing beneath the upper dam and within the dam body as well. Uh, no stability analysis of the upper basins, same as the lower basin were ever performed. And no, no uh, geotechnical consideration on the foundation soil will ever, will ever taking into consideration at all. There is no, no detailed characterizations that, would, that was done on the foundation materials. And the other major thing is that no drainage was incorporated around the tailings facility. So meaning that all the, as you can see, I'll, I'll go back in here, all, all the surficial runout during like rainstorms or normal uh, rainfall events was basically flowing directly into the dam body from the upper, from the upper valley. So there was no diversion ditches, nothing. So everything was feeding into into the two the two facilities right away from from upstream. Um, 
And so by early 80s, by end of 85, we have that, you know, the upper dam rose and between 1980 and 1982, there was basically a, the production stopped. The production stopped because of economic reasons and, uh, and so there was no disposal between 1980 and 1982. To save costs in 1982, the company decided to say, well, we own several mines in a 100 and or 200 kilometer radius around, uh, around Prestavel. So why not use Stava as the main hub to process the tailings? And so what happened, they reestablished operation, they reestablished the flotation process. But what happened is that they started to increase the rate of operation and the rate of deposition within the tailings facility. It was way higher the rate of raise of the dam than it used to be before. But from May and June 1985, the mining operations were suspended again. And they were suspended because they didn't, they, they needed to drain up both basins to do some maintenance on the decant pipes, that two pipes that were used to drain and help draining the facility uh, needed, to for, needed some maintenance. And then in July, 1985, was the 15th of July, 1985, the operation resumes, the upper dam crest reached the height of about 32 meter, 35 meter, apologies. Why they needed maintenance on the Deacon's pipe? Well, they need maintenance because they were keeping on failing. And in fact, in January, 85, there was a huge sinkhole and a, and a landslip that happened on this flank of the upper basin. And, uh, and so they were keeping on closing it up until they couldn't do any more than that because even in June, uh, they, they say, okay, enough is enough. Uh, so in May, they decided to work and try to, um, to, to repair the, um, the decant pipe. In addition to that, even in June 85, even the lower basin started having issue in June and in May, one sinkhole in May and another, and another leakage and, and uh, from the Deacon pipe in June, 1985. So they drain everything that's, they started to work on this, they, they fixed, but, and then in, on the, in July 15, and I was saying before, what happened was that they, you know, a uh, new Deacon system was restored. Um, the basins were refilled and operations started again. So why the pipes were keeping on failing? Um, as I said earlier, uh, the original permits were for small dams, nine meter, 10 meter high. For the upper basin, they didn't have a real design. So what was happening in here is that they underdesigned the Deacon pipes. So they were not able to withstand the height and the pressure from the tailings above them. So by doing that, there were uh, uh, continuous breakage and continuous failures uh, within those Deacon pipes that were pretty much what they were doing, instead of having the, the drainage pipe helping draining and, and, and managing the phreatic surface within the dam, they were actually keeping on pumping water within the dam during the entire, during the entire um, basically um, uh, life of the facilities. So even during the, the analysis performed after, of, during the trial, uh, you know, the attention was, uh, went straight away to how saturated this entire system was. And so when they were looking at the upper dam, and we will see in a minute why everything is focused on the upper dam. So they realized the, the investigation, the independent investigation, they realized that the upper dam was critically saturated. High groundwater levels and interspercolation due to the presence of this thick layer of fluvioglacial deposit acting as foundation material that was feeding water into the facility. There was an absence of an under drainage from the two ba basins into the glacial fluvial deposit. So there was no way that the basins were draining out their, their water and the system that was put in place to drain the water wasn't actually working, was keeping on failing, pumping more water to, into to the system. And as I said earlier, that there was no water management system, surficial water management system built around the facility so that at least the surface water would have been diverted from the facility itself. And, and in these graphs in here, as you can see, that's basically a flak 2D analysis run in late eighties um, in which using knowledge that were available at the time, 
uh, before before the trial, as you can see, by varying, uh, even by varying the degree of saturation of the analysis based on the year, you can see that the factor of safety were pretty pretty low, and 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 basically the deformation zone uh, within the upper dam was chasing after the constructors as the as the dam was raising, so pretty much they were they were playing with fire. Um, an unofficial comment from people that were deeply involved in the in the in the investigation. Uh, one thing that the that, that the geotechnical engineer working on this were were surprised, quote unquote, is that you know the, the, the surprise was how come it didn't fail earlier? Because they were basically keeping on keeping on playing playing with fire. Uh, so as as you can see in here that there is no one single cause that led to the failure. It was a multitude of, of events from the start to the, the history of, of the mining operation until 19th of July that led to, to, this, uh, to this event. But because of that, that create, uh, there was a sort of like a unicum event for the trial. Uh, the judge was in a very tough position in how to, not necessarily a tough position, but it was, they had to make a choice on how to proceed this one. Both basins, were, 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 were unstable. There were deficiencies in the de design management of both basins, but they couldn't chase both of them. The, so a choice was, was made because from the technical investigation, uh, the outcome was that the kinematic of event uh, saw the upper basin failing first and then triggering the, the, the liquefaction of the lower basin, a decision was made to go after initially to whoever was in charge for the upper basin. And so that's, that's, the, that's, that's the way that even the process and the trial uh, went on. Um, the trial started in 88 and then it ended in 1992. 10 people were convicted of multiple manslaughter of culpable catastrophe. And they were the one responsible for building and managing the upper basin, which collapsed at first and the managers of the mine and some official of the company that were all involved in the construction and the development of the upper basin. And, and the people responsible from the mining district of the eponym province of, of Trento because they did they failed basically provide the right checks and on the tailing stem. Uh, don't worry, it's Italy, not a lot of jail time for these people. Just a pat in the head, say, and the back, say, please don't do that again. Uh, that's pretty much what, what kind of happened. Um, so there was a sentence. And there was also like a um, um, basically a, there was like a compensation to the victims. And that compensation um, was issued in 2004, and it was subdivided between owners, like mining company, and whoever you know owns now that 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 company, and the province of Trento as well. Uh, <clears throat> so the I'll, I'll, I'll skip through all of these specific descriptions that you could, you will, you know, you can pause the video and see it and, and go through it. But one of the main things that I want to stress is that as a consequence, as, as a result of the trial and all the technical investigation, it was pretty clear that, 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 the, that, that the, 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 the tailing stems failure occurred as a consequence of negligence, incompetence, lack of expertise, lack of ethics and responsibilities and greed. Of the person of the professional that were in charge of the design and the maintenance um, of the dam, they know they were building these structures within a highly populated and densely populated area. During the trial, someone was even uh, was even uh, from the defendant saying, "Why? Well, the, why you're going to build houses down those river, right?" So, but the houses were there since a long time, um, and then all the investigations that could have been done were not done because they were deemed to be too expensive. Were mean, deemed to be too expensive and would have undermined the reputation of the company should you know, the, um, the outcome of the investigation show that there were critical, it was a critical situation or there were risks to the, to the, to the population. Uh, the idea, especially from the mining company, is that that was like a, a, a temporary structure. It's a tailings facility. It's not a con it's not like a permanent structure. So why bother spending a lot of a lot of time and a lot of money on that one? 
And, and the judge was pretty strong in his verdict. And he said that in the history of the Stava disaster, it was a clear, it was clear that the lack of ethic and knowledge, negligence, superficiality, greed of the owners and operation made them unwilling to understand the need for a following best practice and performing proper checks and reviews during the design, construction, and management, uh, as well as for the proper maintenance and monitoring of uh, procedures. And then he, he did a calculation and he said that if only one tenth, and that is, you know, sums up everything in here, if, if only one tenth of the amount of money and efforts that was spent during the trial, if one tenth of this amount of money would have been spent for the safety uh, of the tailings, most likely this accident wouldn't have happened. So even if we're saying that it comes down to money, it, it's not. Uh, unfortunately, Stava was not the first one, and we are all well aware that it won't be the last tailings failure. Um, there are a lot of analogies between Stava and other tailings dam failure. This one is shocking uh, of the Zgodegra tailings failure that happened in Bulgaria in 1966. We ended up as a foundation. Uh, the foundation ended up being in contact with the people in Storygrad. And as we go through what happened, um, the similarities in what happened, it with Stava are, are quite are quite incredible. Um, there are many other spaders from the most recent in, in, in South Africa to the well-known in Mount Poly, in Bent Rodriguez, Tahoshi, Aberfan, Kolontar in Hungary. Those are just are just some of them, right? And then we are all familiar with, with the one that happened in 2019, the Brumandino tailings failure with unfortunately like 270 people um, are considered to be dead. And with 259 confirmed dead and 11, they're still, they're, still, they're still missing. And so as we are seeing, it's not like the, the, the disasters and, and, and tailings failures are irregular, unfortunately, right? They're, they're happening, they keep on happening. And if we try to, to consider a little bit and put together some, some, some graphs in here, something very interesting starts to show up. If on the right side here is the is, is two graphs that, that uh, my colleague Terry Eldridge put together, and you can see uh, you know, frequencies of events by year and then reported fatalities. And it's kind of interesting to see that there is a kind of like a pattern in here, right? Kind of every 20 years, 15 years, there is something big that is happening. Um, it would be interesting to, to understand and dive in a little bit too in detail. Some of the ideas is that, you know, memory and education starts to play a role. You have a big event, there is a huge push, especially for the educational part for, you know, newly graduated geotechnical engineers or experts working in or subject matter experts that are very fresh to what had happened. And so in university curricula and stuff like the, um, the, uh, the idea of never again, right? So you start studying this event in a little bit more detail and then the memory or, you know, the, uh, the reaction, the, the sentimental reaction to this big catastrophe sort of dies off and boom, there is another one. We kind of forget how we do, how we forget how, we, how to build or how to manage things in a proper way. And then boom, there is another event. And there seems to be this sort of like, you know, rough 20, 30 years of, of, of gaps between big big events and the problem the main problem is that, that if we start from the 60s for example Aberfan all the way down to the 2019 event in in, in Brumandino uh, history kind of repeats itself and if we look at what Mar Dr. Morgenstern uh, who is well renowned uh, expert in tailing stems uh, says is that that if we're looking at all the, 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 the um, technical reports after these disasters, uh, it's pretty clear that these failures arises from deficiencies in engineering practice. And that, 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 that are, you know, that the move around between uh, design, construction, quality control, quality insurance, and the involvement of the local communities. And that's, and that's very, very disconcerting um, in, in finding. And, and I would suggest to whoever is interested, I would suggest to everybody, to be fair, go and read the Aberfan, uh, uh, the Aberfan Inquire report 
and go look at the Mount Poly one. You don't need to be a subject matter expert, but look at the bigger picture, the, the steps that led to some choices, some, some ideas or, or decisions not taken. And you can find still a lot of similarity. For instance, if you take the Aberfan report and you compare it with, with, with Mount Poly, for example, one, <laughs> The, 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 the recommendation are, are, are very, 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 very similar. So is it a problem of uh, scientific and, and technical knowledge? No, we, we have the technology, as we say, we, have, we, we know how to build these things. There is something else in here that is missing and it's more like the relationships that we're having between ourselves and between people and between local communities. And, and uh, one thing that maybe we should start doing a little bit more is planting the seed of doubts in everything that we're doing. What if, what if, instead of being sure in our ideas and always keep on thinking, okay, am I missing something? What if we should do something different? So uh, what can we do, you know, to sort of work towards the zero harm idea to sort of, you know, reduce the, the consequences and reduce the risks with tailings facility. Well, one of the steps towards that is, is the global industry standards that have been proposed in 2020 is the first step. This will be like the start of, of having some standards in which, you know, by following them, we, we, we make sure that there is a, a structure that will move forward in, in reducing the risks of, of failure and impact specifically. And one of the things that I like the most about the global industry standard is that, is that as the forefront, as the topic number one, the, the guideline number one is community. The, the communities involved in this, in this facility or the world could be impacted by this facility, they have to be in the forefront since, since the early stages of, of the design. Uh, there has to be the involvement of the local community. They have to be part of the, of, of the systems because those people are the one that would um, have the most effect, be affected most by this facility for, for anything that could happen, All right? So that's, that's the first step, R reminding ourselves every time that when we're building a, a facility, um, unless you are like in the middle of nowhere, but even in that case, you have the environment in that case, that the environment and the, and the local communities should be in the forefront every single time. Uh, uh, other ideas thrown in, we, we, need, we need to improve the safety inspection. We need to have, uh, we need to champion ethics over short-term profit. And short-term zero, zero with tailings, or we can work towards a, 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 a a long-term zero mine waste, for example, where we can, let's reuse those waste material. And one of the main things that the entire global mining community should do is target underperformers. We need to focus on them and help them to reach industry standards to, and to go back into, into an acceptable standards. Um, the foundation that's in our, in our small world, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep the memory of Stava alive every single day so that these 268 people I did not die in vain. So our goal is to is to keep on, you know, strengthen the contour of prevention, correct landscape and territorial management and environmental management um, to reduce the shortcomings that led to this big, big catastrophe. And uh, I'll uh, I'll thank you a lot for the opportunity, and I will and I will leave you, and I'll close my my talk. With uh, with a helicopter fly taking the day of the disaster over over the Stava Valley.